Welcome everyone. My name is Doreen Zutterland. I'm a CLL SLL patient and advocate and a member of the CLL Society's Patient Advisory Board. Unfortunately, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties today, so I'm only gonna be able to join you by audio. So we will just continue. We are live with CLL Society's Facebook live event, Ask Me Anything, where we'll spend the next 60 minutes answering your questions with a CLL expert and we're so lucky to have Dr. Matthew Davids joining us today. There are no presentations and we encourage you to ask your questions on the Facebook page if that's how you're joining us or through the Zoom platform if you're able. This event is dedicated to your questions, so please ask them early to make sure we get uh, to as many as possible. Before we begin, I have a few important disclaimers to share. Nothing said today should be taken as medical advice. Any questions about your health and treatment should be discussed with your healthcare provider. The information you post on Facebook will be shared on a public forum, so please do not post or share confidential information. Without further ado, Dr. Davids, would you please introduce yourself for our audience? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Shereen. So it's great to be with you all today from scorching hot Boston, where it's about 91 degrees. Uh, this is not the view from my office. I wish it were, but uh, it's a beautiful time of year here in summer. And uh, as, as most of you know, or many of you know, uh, I'm a CLL specialist based here at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. I'm also an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I spend a lot of my time answering individual patient questions for CLL. So this feels very efficient today because uh, hopefully I can answer a lot of questions that will be beneficial for many people to hear all at the same time. So really looking forward to today and uh, please do ask me anything. Okay, great. Thank you. Now for our first question, uh, they're not in any particular order. So we'll just, uh, we'll just launch in. Do you have any experience, advice, and or comments on CLL patients who are on watch and wait taking vitamin D, E, A, and AHCC supplement? So uh, I don't have much specific advice for those particular supplements. I would say that there is a literature that's small, but it does suggest that CLL patients who have vitamin D deficiency uh, may not have as good of outcomes compared to patients who are, are what we'd say replete with vitamin D, normal vitamin D levels. So I certainly do encourage patients who have vitamin D deficiency to take vitamin D supplements to bring it back to the normal range. And, and that is something that we routinely check in our patients to make sure they're not vitamin D deficient. Uh, but beyond that, with, with those other supplements, uh, I'm not aware of any data specific to CLL that would support their use in a watch and wait population. Okay. All right. Uh, I've been recently diagnosed with severe osteoporosis on a DEXA scan, which is a bone, bone density scan, and PCP uh, recommended Fosamax. Can you provide information or direct me on what treatment or treatments would be appropriate for someone with CLL? This is a 65-year-old male uh, with high-risk CLL. So as, as many of you know, the average age at diagnosis for CLL is around 68 to 70 years. So uh, that is an age at which osteoporosis and osteopenia is also quite common. Uh, so we certainly see a lot of these conditions in patients with CLL, but we don't have any evidence to suggest that the CLL is directly responsible or driving uh, osteoporosis or osteopenia. So generally what I would recommend is doing whatever your primary care physician is recommending anyway. So if they're recommending Fosamax, then uh, I certainly would, would go with that. Uh, that vitamin D question comes up again in, in patients with osteoporosis, osteopenia. It is important to be on vitamin D and calcium supplements as well for most patients. Uh, but outside of that, there's no particular restrictions in terms of what you should be treated with based on having CLL. Okay, and here's a somewhat related question. Does untreated CLL affect bone health? Not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. All right, how evidence-based is the protocol to treat new CLL patients for one year in a time-limited combination therapy or two years for relapsed folks like me? So I'm, I'm assuming this question is, is referring to venetoclax-based treatment, uh, because that's sort of the paradigm that has developed over the last few years, where patients in the frontline setting are typically treated with a year of venetoclax with an initial six-month combination with obinutuzumab. Uh, 
And patients in the relapse setting are typically treated with two years of venetoclax with an initial six-month combination of rituximab. So uh, those recommendations are evidence-based based on large phase three randomized trials that compared those regimens to older chemotherapy-based standards of care. Uh, in the frontline setting, the CLL14 trial did one year of therapy. And so that's why we do that because it's that's the evidence that we have. Uh, in the relapse setting, the Murano study studied two years of uh, venetoclax with rituximab. And again, that's why we typically do it that way because that's the evidence that we have. Now, that being said, we don't know that these are the optimal durations of treatment uh, for patients. We, we have a sense, actually, that obinutuzumab is probably a better antibody to treat CLL than rituximab. And so there are studies underway now looking at different durations of therapy of venetoclax and also, um, to some degree, looking at obinutuzumab in the relapse population, although not a lot of clinical trials are looking at that question. So for now, I, I do typically try to stick to where we have the evidence, but eventually, hopefully, we'll have more data to support different lengths of therapy. Uh, we may get into this in part of the questions around minimal residual disease, MRD-guided therapy. Uh, that might actually affect the duration of venetoclax. So I think really the, the data that we have now do support the current recommendations, but hopefully we'll generate more data to have you know, more individualized therapy in the future. Okay, great. Um, is there anything I can do to help prevent splitting fingernails while on, on Imbruvica? This is a very common issue in patients on Imbruvica. It can happen on the other BTK inhibitors as well, but it is more common with Imbruvica. And a uh, couple of tricks that patients of mine have, have told me about. So certainly using good moisturizers, uh, particularly ones like Aquaphor, for example, have been helpful. Some of my patients will slather that on and then actually put on some gloves at night and kind of sleep, sleep with that, uh, and, and that can be helpful. Uh, the other pearl that I've heard uh, is to try biotin supplements. Uh, some patients have had luck with that. Uh, and if it's if it's really too difficult to deal with, despite some of these other supportive interventions, you can consider dose reduction of ibrutinib or potentially switching to one of the other BTK inhibitors. Okay, great. Uh, I'm from the Midwest. We have a lot of those gloves with moisturizer on in the Midwest. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Done that before. Okay. Um, is xanabrutinib associated with high blood pressure? Should I consider a different BTK inhibitor? So I would say all of the BTK inhibitors are associated with some degree of hypertension, uh, you know, at least at least to some degree. Uh, we have head-to-head -head studies comparing ibrutinib to acalabrutinib and a separate study of ibrutinib compared to xanabrutinib. Uh, in the, the first study, ibrutinib compared to acalabrutinib, the rate of hypertension was significantly lower with acalabrutinib compared to ibrutinib. I uh, happen to know those numbers. It's about 23% of patients had hypertension, high blood pressure with ibrutinib versus 9% with acalabrutinib. In the other head-to-head -head study of ibrutinib versus xanabrutinib, the Alpine study, there was no difference in the rate of, of high blood pressure between the two arms of the study. So, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to compare across studies. Uh, but if I have, you know, a patient who's really struggling with hypertension, high blood pressure, if they need to be on a BTK inhibitor drug, I typically will use acalabrutinib in that situation. Uh, but that being said, you know, I think it is also reasonable if it's relatively mild hypertension and, and you're otherwise doing well on xanabrutinib to try either a dose reduction or try starting a uh, blood pressure medicine to be able to try to stay on the drug. Okay. Uh, here's also a xanabrutinib related question. It says, can SLL be cured? Is xanabrutinib a good treatment? So two very different questions there, but I can happy to tackle both of them. So, um, okay. yeah, so I, you know, I think that yes, CLL can be cured. We have a precedent for that that's been around for 30 or 40 years now, which is bone marrow transplant from a donor, also known as allogeneic transplantation. And uh, you know, that is obviously a very aggressive treatment that fortunately we don't need to use very much these days for patients with CLL, but there are patients where, you know, back in the day before we had these targeted treatments who needed to go for allo transplant who are still around, you know, decades later now without any evidence of CLL. So that's one scenario where historically we have seen cure, but it's, it's a very limited population that would be eligible. Uh, the other group to mention is the group who are treated with FCR chemoimmunotherapy. So that's fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab. This was a regimen developed at MD Anderson Cancer Center in the early 2000s, and we have patients out 15 to 20 years from their six-month course of FCR. Uh, 
who are still in a complete remission. Uh, these tend to be patients with low genetic risk CLL, uh, for example, mutated IGHV. Uh, they tend to be younger fit patients who can tolerate FCR. And so I think that is still a part of the conversation for, for young fit patients with those low risk markers. Uh, but of course, there are significant risks with the chemoimmunotherapy, and we don't tend to use it very much these days for that reason. So you know, those are sort of two examples of where we've had curative therapies for CLL, but the toxicities have been so much that they're not therapies we would employ routinely today. I'm, okay. hopeful, I'm hopeful that as we start to combine more of the targeted therapies together, that eventually we might be able to develop curative therapies for CLL without such harsh side effects. That is a work in progress. It's, it's certainly not something I would expect to see from a single agent, uh, particularly a BTK inhibitor drug like xanabrutinib, where most patients only have a partial remission, so that's not going to cure the disease. Uh, but as we combine these agents, as I said, I, I think that there may be eventually more hope for developing curative therapies that are less toxic. Okay. And, and I'll just reiterate, because we have uh, folks that are in varying degrees of learning about their CLL and SLL. This question specifically referenced SLL, but if you would just explain to folks that it, it's basically the same disease and treated the same way yeah, as so SLL. Got, yeah, the great, great point, Doreen. Um, so CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and SLL, small lymphocytic lymphoma, really are the same disease. Uh, the way I like to explain it is it's, the difference is just more a matter of where the cells are concentrated. So in SLL, they're concentrated mostly in the lymph nodes, the spleen and the bone marrow. In other words, we don't see a lot of these cells circulating in the blood, so we can't call it a leukemia, which really the definition of leukemia is the cancer cells circulating in the blood. Whereas with CLL, uh, there's a, a threshold of 5,000 of these B cells, and if it's above that threshold, then we call it leukemia or CLL. Um, there still, of course, can also be lymph node enlargement and other features with CLL. But I, I would really encourage you to think of these two conditions, CLL and SLL, as, as identical uh, in terms of the prognosis and the treatments and, and so forth. Okay. Uh, next question is, why after being on a calibrutinib for a year, do I still experience horrible fatigue? And, and I can second that emotion. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, well, first, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, you know, fatigue is uh, unfortunately very common um, for many people, um, and there's many reasons why fatigue uh, can occur. Uh, some of it can be associated with CLL itself. Some of it can be associated with different therapies. Uh, I would say that one informative data set that we've recently seen presented is a study called the CLL-12 trial which took CLL patients who had higher genetic risk markers and randomized them to early intervention with ibrutinib or placebo, and has now followed those patients out for several years. And specific to this question, I think it was interesting that in the ibrutinib arm of the study, about 24% of the patients experienced fatigue. And in the placebo arm of the study, 21% of the patients experienced fatigue. And so statistically, there was no difference there. To me, that suggests that it's probably not the abrutinib, or in this case, the acalabrutinib that's causing fatigue, that it's you know, either related in some ways to, to the CLL, or if the CLL is in remission, then possibly it's related to, to other causes. And so when I have patients who have fatigue, but their CLL is in remission, uh, I do try to put on my internal medicine cap and think about other diagnoses. Is there low thyroid function, uh, other hormonal imbalances? Uh, are patients not sleeping well? Uh, do they have sleep apnea, for example? So there's a number of things, obviously, that can contribute to fatigue, and, and it's, uh, I think, pretty rarely due to the drugs themselves. Okay. Uh, here's another acalabrutinib question. Uh, I've been taking acalabrutinib since May 2020. Great response as blood count is normal and no side effects. How long will the joy ride last? <laughs> yeah, so we have evolving data now for the Elevate TN study, which is probably the best study to help answer this question. So this was a trial of several hundred patients treated with acalabrutinib. Actually, in the study, they were treated with or without the obinutuzumab infusions. But if you look at the acalabrutinib alone arm, which is probably most reflective for this patient, about three quarters of the patients are still in remission five years after starting acalabrutinib. So often in these studies, we, we in, in the field think about what we call median progression-free survival, which is sort of like the average time that a patient goes on a, on a therapy until they have worsening of the CLL. And so if it's 75% at five years, you know, it's, it's still hasn't reached sort of the median, the average yet. So 
it's probably going to be eight, nine years average. You know, it's hard, hard to say exactly how the curves will evolve over time, but that, that would sort of be my best guess. And so there will be patients who go even longer than that. Patients will go 12, 13, 14 years on drugs like acalabrutinib. Uh, but remember that all of these data that I'm mentioning are in patients who are on a continuous treatment with the drug. So we don't really know much about what happens if you stop the drug, uh, and we don't know how long the response will last. So that's typically not something I would recommend, even for a patient who's in a good remission. Uh, as long as they're tolerating the drug well, I think it's best to continue it. Okay. All right. A next question. Will bone marrow MRI replace bone marrow biopsy? Bone marrow MRI will not. Um, maybe they meant bone marrow MRD, um, possibly, or just maybe MRD in general. I, I'm not aware of any studies looking at MRI specifically in CLL. I don't think that would be a very sensitive way to pick up disease. Uh, you know, I think maybe just to kind of a uh, little bit of a tangent that's related to this question, though, is that I think we are moving away from doing as many bone marrow biopsies as, as we used to do because we have this test now called MRD or minimal residual disease. Some people call it measurable residual disease. And what this does is it allows us to detect these tiny quantities of CLL cells, even at a molecular level when we can't even see them under the microscope. And it turns out this is a test we can send from the blood rather than doing a bone marrow. And it seems to predict the response to therapy perhaps even better than the, the traditional bone marrow exam that we, that we do. So I'm hoping we'll be moving more away from bone marrow biopsies and more toward this, this blood test, which obviously is a lot less painful for patients. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the motivation of these patients. Let's yep. not uh, let's let's avoid that needle if possible. Very understandable. Uh, yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question. Please offer thoughts on relief from night sweats. So night sweats is another tricky one where you know we need to figure out in a particular patient what the cause is. You know, if the cause of the night sweats is CLL that's not treated, uh, then uh, you know if they're really debilitating night sweats, then that that is generally a reason to treat the CLL to try to get that better. But you know, a lot of times I have patients who have issues with night sweats and they have a very minimal burden of CLL disease. Maybe they have stage zero disease with some circulating cells, but they don't have any enlarged lymph nodes or spleen and. And that's always ch a challenging situation because it, it's hard to blame it on the CLL when there's not much CLL around. Uh, certainly could be, but we always, again, look into other causes, particularly hormonal causes. Uh, a lot of uh, perimenopausal women uh, around the time of menopause will have those symptoms, for example. So certainly want to rule out other causes. And you know, in patients who do have a larger burden of CLL disease, if they're having drenching sweats, the other thing that comes to mind is Richter syndrome, which is when CLL can transform into a more aggressive lymphoma. And uh, you know that is one potential feature of Richter syndrome. Just just because the patient's having night sweats, it doesn't mean they have that. But it just sort of makes it enter the the realm of possibility. And and if it's if there's other signs pointing toward that, then doing some scans might be helpful to to look for any evidence of of Richter's. Okay. All right. Next question. I have been on watch and wait for three years. At which point should I add a specialist? Uh, I'm assuming a CLL specialist to my care team. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, the CLL Society's recommendations that it's it's good to have a CLL specialist on your team if if possible. And so I don't think there's any time that's really too early for that. Uh, you know, I think some of it uh, depends on logistics, and you know, some patients would have to travel a great distance, or their insurance doesn't cover a second opinion consult. So in, in those scenarios, maybe it's not as as critical to to fight through that, but. You know, I think if your insurance will cover it and it's not too inconvenient to, to come in to see a CLL specialist, I think that's you know a good a good time to do it is is any time that you know you can and and then that way they kind of know you and and you know you might not need to follow with the CLL specialist every three to six months. You can still follow with your local team, but that way you know once your local oncologist is saying oh I think it's time to to you know move forward with treatment, then you can go back to your CLL specialist who already knows you and say number one do you agree that this is the right timing because there's there's a lot of nuance that goes into that decision of when to start CLL treatment. And I think CLL specialists have a good pulse on that. And then number two, the CLL specialist will have a good sense of what's the, the latest kind of state-of-the-art approach to treatment. And if you're interested in clinical trials also, you know whether there might be a good clinical trial that's a fit for you where that might not be an option from your local oncologist. So certainly uh, I do encourage patients to connect with, with CLL specialists. The other program to, to plug uh, through CLL Society is the Expert Access Program, uh, where many of us as CLL specialists can connect through this technology, through, through Zoom with patients, 
And we've been doing that now for a few years, and it's been a, a great way to reach patients who are geographically more isolated, not able to get to a, a major center where there's a CLL specialist. And uh, I don't I don't think it's completely a substitute for establishing care with a CLL specialist, but it could certainly help bridge that gap. Great, great advice. Um, next question. I have been a CLL patient for 10 years and have recently been diagnosed with autoimmune autoimmune hemolytic anemia. How does this affect my prognosis as a CLL patient? Are there any issues I should be looking out for, like cardiovascular side effects? And do you recommend any particular type of follow-up for patients with a, um, AIHA and CLL? So just, just for those who are um, a little newer to CLL, what, what AIHA is, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, is basically an immune response that the body has that is probably orchestrated in some way that we don't understand well by the CLL. And it causes the normal immune system to attack your red blood cells and cause them to, to burst open. And so that can lead to anemia. Uh, and uh, it's it's very important to recognize this. It's it's not usually too difficult. It can be diagnosed with, with blood tests. Uh, and the reason why it's so important to identify this as the cause of anemia rather than CLL progression is that the, the treatment is very different. Uh, so usually with autoimmune hemolytic anemia, you can give steroids like prednisone, for example, and that will help correct it. And uh, usually that takes care of it. If it doesn't, we can add on a treatment like rituximab, which is an antibody infusion to help the steroids to work better. And usually between those two therapies, we can control most cases of AIHA. And occasionally we'll find a patient where they don't respond to either of those treatments. And in that case, we will usually treat the CLL itself. So there's no particular cardiovascular risks in a sense. I mean, really the, the main thing would be if you're very anemic, then your heart doesn't like that because you don't have enough blood to, to pump around. So, uh, but outside of that, you know, once, once the autoimmune process is, is um, corrected, you know, there's no particular cardiovascular risks. I'm not aware of any clear links between the development of autoimmune hemolytic and the eventual prognosis for the CLL. You know, again, usually this is pretty controllable with these supportive measures like steroids. And if not, usually patients do respond well to CLL treatment. Okay. Next question. If someone has been on venetoclax and abrutinib continuously for several years and the symmetry shows that the CLL cell number has plateaued and is not dropping further, does that mean that the CLL has developed resistance to both of the drugs? That is uh, an unusual regimen. That must be a patient who was on one of the early clinical trials of abrutinib and, and venetoclax. Um, you know, I think that you know, it does suggest that there may be some level of, of resistance from those cells. Uh, that being said, you know, this is something we see with the BTK inhibitor drugs very commonly. So even in patients just on ibrutinib, they can often have a low level of CLL present. And as long as the drug is, is controlling the disease, uh, even if there is a little bit of resistance, then uh, probably doesn't matter so much. I guess the implication here is that if there's resistance to both drugs arising, that is a little bit more problematic in the sense that if you needed to then switch to a a new treatment, uh, then you probably would not be able to use a traditional co covalent BT cannabis drug or venetoclax. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure at some point we'll we'll get to uh, pertubrutinib, which is a, a newer non-covalent BTK inhibitor, and it sounds like that could potentially be a good option for a patient like this if they do develop progression of the CLL well on both abrutinib and venetoclax. Uh, if, if a patient has experienced severe infusion reactions from rituximab, is this also likely to happen with obinutuzumab infusions? So the short answer is no. Um, we have this discussion frequently with our allergy colleagues, and they tell us that the reaction cross-reactivity rate is, is very low. And so generally, we do feel comfortable, even in a patient who's had a more severe rituximab reaction, for example, to try obinutuzumab, because the likelihood of reacting again is, is low. Uh, you know, that being said, particularly patients who have a high burden of CLL disease, in other words, big lymph nodes, very high white blood cell count in particular, those tend to be patients who are at higher risk for these reactions. So particularly if I've had a patient who had a prior reaction, I'll try to do things to reduce the, the burden of the disease a bit first before starting the antibody. And that could be something like steroids, or it could be even something like a BTK inhibitor drug if I'm thinking of using that type of drug eventually in combination anyway. Okay. Are bruising, skin irritation, and joint discomfort all common side effects from a calibrutinib? 
Correct. Yes, those are those are all common. Um, the rates of bruising and, and other skin conditions, though, are less with acalabrutinib compared to ibrutinib from the head-to-head -head study. Uh, so, yeah, it is still, unfortunately, something patients have to deal with. And there, there is still risk of, of more significant bleeding issues with acalabrutinib as well, uh, and with xanabrutinib, the newest of these covalent BTK inhibitor drugs. Uh, so it is something that we still have to be mindful of and, and counsel patients about, you know, being aware of this. Okay. In the next few years, what do you see will become the predominant novel therapy for newly treated, uh, for, I guess, uh, treatment-naive CLLers? So, you know, I, I think there will continue to be a role in the next few years for single-agent BTK inhibitor therapies, and probably acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib are going to be the main ones that people are using going forward in the next few years. Uh, you know, a lot of the reason for that is that it's so easy to start those drugs. It's very convenient. They're just pills. They don't need a lot of monitoring, et cetera. Uh, but where I, I think the field is probably heading a little bit more uh, is, is toward the venetoclax-based combinations, because when you combine these BTK inhibitor drugs with venetoclax, you have a major advantage, which is the time-limited nature of the therapy. And, uh, you know, I think it's nice for a lot of patients to only have one year or in some cases two years of therapy and then be able to come off all the treatment. Uh, which certainly reduces the side effects that we experience uh, from, from the treatments. And so far, based on the data we have, it suggests that these types of combinations can have very durable responses where patients can stay in remission without the need for ongoing therapy for many years. And the hope would then be that if the disease comes back at some point, that you could then use the same drugs again uh, to, to treat and, and the disease should respond again. Uh, but we're still working on collecting more data to feel more comfortable about, the, about that approach. Okay. Here, we're, we're going back to a little bit of a fatigue question here. Since CLL comes with impaired immunity, is it possible that on and off fatigue during watch and wait is a sign that the body is fighting off infections? Yeah, I think that's a very reasonable hypothesis. I think that would be a little challenging to prove definitively. But yeah, I think the, the question asker is, is on the right track that you know, there's, there's certainly decreased immunity. We know that for sure with patients who have CLL. And so there may be times where you might be fighting off viral infections, you know, that uh, may make you more fatigued and, and then eventually your immune system kind of takes care of it. I mean, I think that to some degree happens for people who don't have CLL as well, uh, but these effects may be a little bit exaggerated in, in patients who have CLL. Okay, great. Um, what are the questions we can ask our oncologist to be sure he or she is qualified to treat CLL? Well, um, you know, I, I think one area that is maybe a good litmus test to some degree is asking about some of the genetic markers. Uh, so certainly fish, IGHV, and, and TP53 status are, are very important in terms of understanding the biology of a patient's CLL in particular. And so hopefully they would sort of be familiar with those those tests. And, uh, you know, I think there's still some debate about when to send the tests. Uh, certainly, I do think it's important to send these tests in a patient who needs to start treatment. Uh, sometimes oncologists who don't focus as much on CLL like to make the argument that they don't matter as much at, at diagnosis in a patient who might go several years until needing treatment. And while it is true that it doesn't necessarily prompt the need for intervention based on the markers, I do find that most of my patients kind of want to know more about the biology of their disease. It helps us to think about the likely timeline of when treatment might be needed. Uh, and so kind of getting a sense for, for that and, and how the local oncologist feels about those markers, at least that hopefully they know about them. And even if they're not testing them, at least if it's sort of a, a rational reason why they're doing that, and I, I think that's okay. Uh, so th that would sort of be one way, I guess, to start to get at that information. Yes, I, I think also asking how many CLL patients uh, um, a particular doctor has lets you know uh, how much they deal with that in, in, daily, in their daily practice. That, that uh, has been helpful as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And I would say, you know, in addition to that, maybe even asking, because there, you know, most community oncologists will have some panel of CLL patients, but also not just how many do they have, but how many have they treated? Uh, yeah. Because a lot of patients won't need treatment. And it is helpful to have an oncologist who at least has some experience using these drugs in, in treating CLL. Yes. Uh, here's a, a question that harkens a little bit back to what you were talking about, BTK inhibitors being uh, to be taken indefinitely. The question is, is there any evidence about the risks and benefits of eventually taking a patient off of brutinib? 
what's the smallest effective dosage of ibrutinib? At my insistence, over four years, I've gone down from 420 milligrams daily to 140 milligrams daily. So I guess the, the question is, is that okay? Yeah, so a cu couple different questions packed in here. So the, the, okay. the first, yeah, the first one is, is sort of around, I think, sort of a time-limited BTK inhibitor course. And you know we don't have studies that have read out yet that have really looked at this in a, in a planned way. I would say that there there is a large study in the U.S. from one of our cooperative groups that looked at ibrutinib-based treatment in a younger population, uh, and there were several hundred patients receiving ibrutinib in this study. And of those patients, there were 95 patients who did have to stop ibrutinib early due to side effects. So it's not that they were told to stop ibrutinib because they were in a good remission, it's that they kind of had to stop ibrutinib because they weren't tolerating it well. And when they then followed those patients out over the, the next few years, the average patient went about two years from the time they stopped ibrutinib until the time they needed uh, treatment again, So, or to the time the CLL had progressed. So I, I think that's encouraging that you know there are some studies underway now trying to look at more abbreviated courses of these BTK inhibitor drugs. And uh, I, I hope that we can get an evidence base to support that approach, because it'd be nice to not have to use them for so long. Um, the dosing question is a, is a separate one, and that one is pretty tricky. Because uh, it also hasn't been as rigorously studied. There was a, a small study that was done at MD Anderson Cancer Center where they had started patients on the full dose. And then fairly quickly, even within the first year, they started dropping down the dose. And they looked at the blood samples from those patients to see how effective the drug was at inhibiting or, or blocking this protein BTK, which is the target. And in their assays, it looked to be pretty effective at, at targeting BTK, even at the very lower doses by using this strategy. But the problem is that hasn't then been studied in a larger group of patients. And there are some studies that have looked back at some of the clinical trials and shown that patients on lower doses of ibrutinib, for example, compared to the patients who were able to stay at the higher dose, those patients on the lower dose had a shorter duration of benefit from the ibrutinib. They were, their CLL was getting worse sooner. So it's kind of indirect evidence, but it's uh, it sort of points in both directions. And for me personally, until I see kind of larger data sets that would support either lower doses or more abbreviated time courses of the drug, I'm kind of sticking where we have the most data so far. Yes. Uh, this question leads into that a little bit and, and I think is pretty much answered, but let, let's answer it for the, the asker. What is your comfort level with giving a patient a drug holiday uh, who has 17P uh, deleted and is unmutated? I've heard a CLL specialist say he doesn't like to give those holidays. And so that sort of just is answered with what you said that you probably shouldn't stop, correct? Yeah, generally, you know, for, for most of my patients who have high risk CLL with 17P deletion or TP53 mutation, I have been recommending continuous treatments with the BTK inhibitors. Now, that said, we still have pretty good evidence that venetoclax-based combination therapies are effective for that group. Uh, so if, if I have a patient who wants to do time-limited therapy and wants to do the year of venetoclax and obinutuzumab, even if they have high-risk disease, uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, those patients can still do well. Um, but, you know, for most patients still, I, I've been recommending the BTK inhibitors. Okay. Uh, this uh, question also, well, I guess they're all connected. Um, do you encourage CLL patients to take biotin? My understanding is that it may interfere with heart tests. And that harkens back to what we were talking about, males uh, getting roughed up with some of the BTK inhibitors. Yeah, I, I don't recommend routinely taking biotin, but in that one specific scenario of BTK inhibitor-induced nail changes or finger little cuts and things like that, I, I think it is helpful in that particular scenario. And I found personally, I did take biotin. I did have the nail issue, but I just stopped five days before thyroid tests or any of the tests that can be impacted by biotin. So you can still get the benefit of the biotin and, and not impact your test if you just um, uh, plan ahead and, and stop taking it for a few days. Yep, great. Okay. Uh, question from a, a younger CLL person in their 30s. Can venetoclax make you sterile? What should someone realistically expect after a year of treatment? Uh, the pamphlet hints at this in dog studies. Yeah, so it's it's an important question. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it's one where we don't have a lot of data because, uh, as you know, most CLL patients are older, uh, and we we don't have clinical trials that have large numbers of patients in their 30s where where that might be uh, studied. 
It is true that in some of the earlier uh, preclinical studies and dog studies that there was some effect of venetoclax on the sperm uh, there. And so uh, it, it's a theoretical concern. Uh, to me, it, it, just from the science of it, it doesn't seem like it would be something that would be irreversible. So, you know, if a patient is actively on venetoclax, I think there's more risk of some impairment there. Uh, but fortunately, because venetoclax is a time-limited therapy, I would, I would hypothesize that once the patient stopped the venetoclax, that any effects on, on sperm, for example, should be reversible. Um, but again, this is still mostly kind of speculation because we don't have data to, to understand this. Okay. Uh, next question is, once diagnosed with SLL and with normal blood parameters, what is the average median time to treat? Uh, how long can they expect watch and wait to last? So this does sort of feed back a little bit into the prior question about the differences between SLL and CLL. So I'll just start by saying I, I don't necessarily view this question as being any different for S SLL as it would for CLL. Uh, and basically, I think the, the most important thing in terms of understanding what those timelines look like is those genetic markers we were talking about, the FISH test, the IGHV test, and, and TP53. Uh, for me, probably it's the IGHV that provides the most granular information around that. And so if you look statistically at time to first treatment in patients with unmutated IGHV, it's in the range of about three to four years of a median, whereas with mutated IGHV, it's more like seven to eight years as a median. Uh, but remember, these are just kind of general statistics, and there's very wide sort of um, confidence intervals on that. And so uh, I have patients with unmutated IGHV CLL who've gone a decade before they need treatment, and I've had patients with mutated IGHV CLL who need treatment within a couple of years. So there, there is a lot of variability, but that's sort of generally, if you look at everything, how the statistics play out. Yes, I, I was originally diagnosed with SLL, and I was 22 months to time to treat. Uh, so it could, it could just varies. So uh, dramatically. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, should someone on a brutinib for five years think about switching to a calibrutinib or xanabrutinib if arthralgia and myalgia are, bo are bothersome? Yes, I, I think that is very worthwhile to, to think about. You know, what I've been telling my patients generally is if they're doing well on ibrutinib and really don't have any significant side effects, they should probably stay on ibrutinib generally uh, because you never know when you switch to a different drug, even though in the aggregate, those, those newer BTK inhibitors do seem to be a bit better tolerated than ibrutinib. You know, they each have their own unique risks. And, and so, you know, if you're otherwise tolerating ibrutinib well, I would stick with it. Now, in this case, if there are very significant uh, joint aches, arthralgias, for example, that is something where in the head-to-head -head studies, the, the newer drugs do seem to be better. Um, and also muscle cramps and spasms also seem to be better with acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib as compared to ibrutinib. So I think uh, depending on how significant that symptom is, that could be a good reason to, to make the switch. Okay. And in the choice between those two drugs, here's the next question. And I'm not familiar with this study, but I'm sure you are, doctor. What are your thoughts on the MAIC study between acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib? Did the findings impact your decision in clinical uh, decision making? So an MI, MAIC is a matched adjusted indirect comparison. So the, this is a statistical analysis that's basically used to compare different trials. And the reason why we need to do this with the question of acalabrutinib versus xanabrutinib is that there's no head-to-head -head study comparing these two drugs. There's a head-to-head -head study comparing acalabrutinib with ibrutinib. There's a head-to-head -head study comparing xanabrutinib with ibrutinib. But you know, since we're using less abrutinib these days and we're using more of the newer drugs, it is an important question right now. How does acalabrutinib compare to xanabrutinib? And so one way to do that is to kind of just eyeball the both studies and kind of look back and forth and just try to get a general sense. That's kind of what a lot of us had been doing. The MAIC is a somewhat more rigorous way to do this statistically, where basically you try to match up the patients from the studies. And if there's patients who are really different in terms of their genetic markers or uh, other, other factors, you can um, take them out of the analysis. And that way you can try to compare the patients from those studies uh, who are most matched to each other. And so you know, when, when you do that with these two drugs, I mean, I would say overall, they they look more similar than they look different. Uh, and so then it sort of comes down to the comfort level of your oncologist with, with each drug, maybe some specific side effects, which, which may be a little more unique to one versus the other. For example, with acalabrutinib, we do think we, we see a little more in the way of headache when patients first start it. Uh, 
Um, so if I have a patient who really struggles with headaches, uh, that might not be the best choice, although it usually is pretty short-lived and, and patients get through that and it gets better. Uh, with, with the Xanabrutinib, there is this question of whether the, the high blood pressure may be more of an issue. I, I think that's still not definitively answered, but again, as we accumulate more data, if I have a patient who's struggling with blood pressure issues already, I might op opt more for acalbrutinib in that scenario, since it at least so far seems like it might be a little bit less. So that's kind of how I think about it. And I do find those MAIC analyses to be somewhat useful because unfortunately, I don't think this is a situation where we're ever going to have a head-to-head -head trial of the two drugs. So we're going to be kind of stuck with these types of statistical analyses to understand the differences. Sure. All right, during watch and wait, is there a special diet that should be considered and is alcohol in moderation okay? No specific diet that I'm aware of has ever been shown to be beneficial or harmful for patients with CLL. Uh, I always tell my patients that you should expect to live for a long time with CLL. And we do know that it's, it's helpful to, to eat a heart healthy diet. So you wanna be eating sensibly for that. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of kind of mythology out there about certain foods to eat or not eat and, you know, a lot of stuff on the internet about sugar and its role. Um, there's no clear link between sugar intake and, and CLL outcomes. So I don't, I don't tell patients to restrict sugar intake beyond what you should be restricting anyway in terms of risks of cardiovascular or diabetes and so forth. Uh, and alcohol in moderation is, is fine. Uh, there's, there's no issues with that. Again, no evidence that that would make CLL worse. Okay. Uh, how is the determination made to put patients on prophylactics, specifically a cyclovir and sulfa trimet? How does one figure out if they've had the shingle shot or has an, auto, uh, an immune system that is working if they need these medications? Are there numbers that we can use to assess the risks and then speak with our doctors? Are there studies on this? Yeah, this is a complicated question. Uh, you know, this used to be more straightforward. When I started taking care of patients with CLL, all we really had was chemoimmunotherapy-based regimens, and we had to use these prophylactic drugs with all the patients because they were all at high risk for, for these infectious complications. As the new therapies have come along, each one has kind of been developed slightly differently. Each study was written a little bit differently. Some of them required these anti-infective uh, prophylaxis drugs like acyclovir and, and trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole. Some of the studies didn't require it. And now in, in clinical practice, some of us do it, some of us don't. So it's kind of all over the place. We were actually interested in this question a few years ago now at, at our practice at Dana-Farber. And so we looked at 217 patients at that point who had been treated with BTK inhibitor-based treatment. And in our practice, it was about half of the patients were on these uh, antibiotics and half of them weren't. And what we found was of these 217 patients, only three developed this infection called PJP pneumonia, which is what we're trying to prevent. Uh, it was all in patients who were not on prophylaxis, but a couple of these patients were on combination regimens with the BTK inhibitors. There, were, there was only one patient who developed PJP while uh, on just the single agent BTK inhibitor, and, and that patient did fine. It was treated and, and they were okay. So you end up having to treat a lot of patients, a few hundred patients probably, to prevent a couple of cases of this. And, and these antibiotics, although they're well tolerated, they do have some risks. For example, with the trimethoprim, you can see significant rash. It can affect other blood counts. So it's not a completely benign intervention. So you know, with all that in mind, I would say that for most of my patients now, if they have not had prior chemotherapy-based treatment, if I'm, if I'm treating them with an initial therapy in CLL, I, I usually don't routinely recommend uh, these antibiotics. As patients get into later lines of therapy, when they've had multiple different treatments in the past, then I'm, I'm more likely to use it. If I'm using combinations of different agents, I'm more likely to use these antibiotics. Um, unfortunately, there's no specific number that I could give you that would sort of be a, a cutoff for, for using it. You know, the IgG number is, is something that your oncologist may be tracking periodically. Uh, when IgG is, is very low, like less than 400 or so, you probably are at a somewhat higher risk of infection. So I guess that could be one factor to, to look at. Um, but yeah, there's no clear evidence one way or the other. Okay. Um, we know that CLL, is the uh, age range for folks that get diagnosed with CLL, SLL is, is in normally in the 70s. So arthritis is common, but this, this questionnaire says, uh, Arthritis does not run in my family, but is it common for those with CLL to develop arthritis? If so, at what stage? I was diagnosed nine years ago, and lately I've experienced arthritis in joints all over my body. So there's there's kind of two main forms of arthritis. Uh, so there's 
what's called osteoarthritis, which is kind of more of a de degenerative process with aging. That's when the joints kind of wear out. And that that is, you know, very common in the general population. And, and to my knowledge, not any more common in patients with CLL compared to the general population. There's another class of arthritis uh, associated conditions that are inflammatory arthritis. So an example of that is rheumatoid arthritis, for example. And that is a little bit more common in patients with CLL. Uh, probably relates to the immune dysfunction of the disease. And so, you know, like we talked about before, sometimes the immune system can kill off red blood cells. That's that autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Uh, sometimes the, the lymphocyte cells can cause inflammation in the joints. Uh, and that would be kind of a condition like, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. So I think in, in these scenarios, it's, it's good to work with your oncologist or your primary care physician to try to rule out an inflammatory arthritis. Uh, if there's a suspicion for that, Sometimes seeing a rheumatologist can be helpful and they can think of, of different interventions that might be helpful there. But if it's more routine osteoarthritis, then uh, it seems less likely to be related to CLL. Okay. What and how can I expect to feel as my CLL progresses? I'm assuming this means in watch and wait. How will my every, overall everyday health situation change? How often should I expect my general practitioner to order blood work and monitor for changes such as doubling? They so, do indicate they're on watch and wait for 10 years and their yeah. uh, white blood cell count is slowly rising. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, you know, incredibly variable. Uh, a lot of the sort of the pace of things will be dictated by the genetics of the CLL, as, as we discussed. You know, I, I think that for most patients, things don't change quickly. It's a chronic disease. And so there may be sort of gradually over the years, the development of, of some fatigue that could be related to the CLL. Uh, eventually some sweats and things like that, weight loss, uh, those tend to only happen as you're kind of approaching the need for treatment. So, um, you know, if those things are happening, that's that's a sign that you may be getting closer to that need. But, uh, you know, many patients go for for decades without having those symptoms. And, and again, some of these symptoms, especially fatigue, can be very difficult to sort out from just normal age-related fatigue or fatigue caused by other factors. But I think certainly if if you're developing fatigue over time that's interfering with the daily activities that you want to do, then that's something that needs to be taken seriously and, and investigated and, and try to rule out the CLL as the cause. Okay. Here's a couple pertobrutinib questions. We'll try to put two in one here. Do yeah. you view pertobrutinib's cleaner profile as translating to better safety, or has this not been proven? And when will it be available for CLL patients? So just to take a step back, uh, pertobrutinib is a new BTK inhibitor drug. So we've been talking mostly so far about ibrutinib, acalbrutinib, and xanabrutinib. So these three drugs are all approved now for CLL. They're all what we would call covalent inhibitors based on their mechanism. Pertobrutinib is in a different class of BTK inhibitor. It's non-covalent, which it, again relates to how the drug targets BTK, but it, it targets it in a very different way. And so this is a, a very exciting new drug that, um, that we have uh, coming. It is uh, very, the, the question asker was talking about sort of the clean profile in terms of the, the drug really targets BTK, the, the main protein that we care about. It doesn't have a lot of off-target effects, meaning it doesn't affect a lot of other proteins in the body. And we think some of those other proteins that are targeted by abrutinib, for example, may relate to some of the side effects. So the hope would be if pertobrutinib really is, is very selectively targeting BTK, that it may be better tolerated than the existing BTK inhibitors that are approved in CLL. Certainly, the data look very promising so far from the large experience. There's about 700, uh, almost 800 patients now who've been treated with pertobrutinib in a very large clinical trial, not just with CLL, but with some other uh, B-cell cancers. And the rates of some of the typical BTK inhibitor side effects like atrial fibrillation and bleeding and high blood pressure are quite low. But I would caution you also that it's still a relatively new drug and a lot of patients have not been on it for that long yet. So as we kind of see more mature data, I think it's going to be helpful to see how, how the side effect profile looks. Uh, there will also be a head-to-head -head trial that will eventually read out in CLL, meaning patients are randomized to get either ibrutinib or pertobrutinib, and that will probably be the most informative study in terms of understanding the, the safety differences and, and whether one is more effective than the other. Uh, pertobrutinib was approved by the FDA a few months ago for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma, so not CLL, but uh, once a drug is approved in any condition, then there is the possibility of trying to get the drug off-label uh, prescribed uh, for a different disease. And so 
Uh, right now, it just recently, last month, got a listing in our guidelines uh, through our National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And that's helpful. Once drugs get listed in that compendium, then insurance companies uh, sometimes will begin to pay for it, even if the drug's not approved for a specific disease. So uh, we probably have limited access now to pertubrutinib through that uh, approach. Uh, it's not a guarantee that the insurance will pay for it, but I think there's very good evidence to, to support it. And so it's certainly something you could ask your oncologist to pursue if, if you're a candidate for the drug. Okay. We have a couple questions here about multiple myeloma. How does it fit in with CLL and do a lot of people have them both? And is there a reason for that? So no, uh, not a lot of people have both. Uh, I have certainly in, you know, encountered a handful of patients over the years who do have both. You know, both, both of these are cancers of B cells, uh, but in multiple myeloma, it's a cancer of a different type of B cell called a plasma cell. Sometimes there's, there's some confusion because one of the hallmarks of multiple myeloma is too much of a certain protein in the blood. And one of the things we can see in CLL is a similar phenomenon where we see too much of, the, of a protein in the blood. Um, uh, M-spike is kind of the technical term for it. Uh, and so I, I sometimes have had this consultation where I have a patient who clearly has CLL with no evidence of myeloma, but they have this M-spike, they have the abnormal protein in the blood. And generally, if that's at a relatively low level, it's probably just related to the CLL. And it, it's probably related to some kind of biological similarity between the two conditions. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that patient will develop myeloma or even that they're at a significantly increased risk of developing myeloma because that scenario is very common, CLL with a little extra protein in the blood. Um, in myeloma, there's, there's a huge amount of this protein in the blood. There's these plasma cells that accumulate in the bone marrow, and then there's often other complications of myeloma, like involvement of the bone marrow and, and other issues. So, you know, if there's a very high level of this protein in the blood in a patient with CLL, I think it is prudent to do some studies to try to rule out multiple myeloma. But again, usually if it's just at a very low level of protein, it's, it's, it's very unlikely that myeloma is present, and it's not something that I would investigate further. Okay. The next question is kind of interesting. It's sort of, uh, uh, I guess it's all science, but this is like a real scientific question. Can BTK uh, inhibitors enter the lymph nodes? Yes, uh, they can. And, uh, and we know this actually uh, thanks to uh, a trial of xanabrutinib. Uh, when they were early developing that drug early on, in addition to sampling the blood and the bone marrow, like we've done with all the different BTK inhibitors, uh, in that study, they also did lymph node biopsies of patients with CLL to see how effective the drug was getting was in terms of getting into the lymph nodes. And it turns out it was very effective at, at getting in there and you know helping to get CLL cells to get out of the lymph nodes. CLL cells tend to be happy when they're in lymph nodes. They're in a protected environment. They're encouraged to grow and, and survive. And that's one of the main effects of these BTK inhibitor drugs is that they can move the cells out of the lymph nodes and into the blood and the CLL cells are not as happy in the blood, especially if they're not able to return to the lymph nodes, and so they'll gradually die off over time. And so we, we certainly know that to be the case with xanabrutinib. I would imagine it's also true with the other BTK inhibitors, abrutinib and, and acalabrutinib, and probably even pertabrutinib. Uh, we just don't have direct evidence to support it uh, from clinical trials. Okay. Um... I guess we should do a couple of the COVID questions we've got here. Um, how does a COVID-19 second booster differ than from the bivalent shot and does one have less risk? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what, what they mean by the second booster. Uh, we've had so many boosters at this point, I'm kind of losing track, but I, I, yes. think, yeah, I think at this point, you know, if, if you've completely gone by the book and followed every recommendation from CDC in terms of immunocompromised patients, should be in the range of about six boosters, uh, one of which should be the bivalent booster, which came out last fall. And uh, we do anticipate uh, it's likely there'll be a, a new uh, booster coming out this fall, which we've been told may have a slightly different profile in terms of which variants of COVID it targets, hopefully targeting some of the more recent ones that we've seen. So I will be encouraging my patients to get that once, once it's available. Uh, but from, from my understanding, there's, there's no major differences between these different boosters in terms of the, the safety or, or the effectiveness. It's more about just kind of staying on schedule with getting the boosters that are being recommended. Okay. What is the status of replacing Evershell for the prevention of COVID? Um, I, I guess that is the new supernova. Is that correct, doctor? 
So yeah, I, I don't know the details of this. I, I have heard sort of through the grapevine that the companies are working on sort of newer versions of Evisheld, I think including AstraZeneca, the company that originally developed Evisheld. Uh, you know, I, I've heard sort of that we wouldn't expect anything new to be around until this fall at the earliest. I think one of the challenges here though, is that it takes a while to develop these types of approaches and you know, probably whatever would come out next is gonna be based on the variants that were circulating several months ago, if not even a year ago. And so again, we may run into similar issues as we did with Evisheld where, you know, at least with Evisheld, there was some period of time where we felt confident it was providing protection. Uh, but then we kind of realized eventually that with the currently circulating variants, it was no longer providing protection. So hopefully if, if a new product comes out, there will be some period of time where, where we can show that it's beneficial. Uh, but I, I worry that also as the virus continues to mutate, that that might be a, a transient period of time. And eventually that product may be out of date as well. Yes. Um, we're getting close on time here, doctor. And I want to, I just want to say thank you. You're so great at this rapid fire. You just switch. You switch gears so so quickly, so we can really try to cover as many questions as possible. So um, let's do uh, one more here. If you have been, or if you're having regular checkups and you're in watch and wait phase, can you explain the symptoms or reasons you should contact your oncologist in between your regular checkups? Yeah. So. It, it depends a little bit on where you are in your disease course. You know, if you're very early on with early stage disease and, you know, you're having a, a cold that's lingering, you know, depending on sort of relationships with your primary care physician or your oncologist, you know, if you have a good primary care physician, it's often fine to, to start with them for kind of more routine things like that. Uh, urinary tract infection, for example, is another example. You know, I, I find that as patients get closer to the threshold of needing CLL treatment, things can get a little more complicated when there's more CLL around, they may be more immunosuppressed. And then certainly when patients are on active treatment, those are patients where I'm encouraging them to, to call us as, as the oncologist first. And, and the primary care physician can still be helpful in a supporting role, but we want to be more involved at that point. Uh, you know, the, the other things to kind of keep an eye on are, are weight, for example. So if, if patients are losing weight unintentionally, uh, that's something where if, if you notice that in between visits uh, might be worth bringing to the attention of the oncologist. Uh, the sweats, as we mentioned before, you know, not, not something that kind of comes and goes for a couple of days, but something that's kind of persistent or, or getting worse. And then the other thing I'll mention, which again is rare, but can happen is if there's one area of lymph nodes that's growing out of proportion to a different area, uh, that can be concerning as an early sign of Richter syndrome, the more aggressive transformation of CLL. And that, that's certainly something you'd want to bring to the attention of the oncologist. Okay. Um, after the beginning of the first treatment with the calibrutinib and venetoclax combination, then pausing treatment, what would be the recommended medication to go back on if and when I relapse, return to a calibrutinib venetoclax or something else? So the short answer is we don't know. Uh, this is something that we are currently studying in clinical trials. Uh, my, my hunch on this is that if you have a time-limited course of acalbrutinib and venetoclax and you go into remission for a long time, and we don't know yet what a long time means, but probably at least a few years, uh, then it may make sense to go back to both drugs and, uh, and again, try to do a time-limited course, and then again, hope that there's a remission off the therapy for some period of time. In patients who may have a shorter remission, uh, you know, let's say they have a calibrutinib and venetoclax for a year, year 14 months, uh, and then a year later, the disease comes back and needs treatment again, I'm less optimistic that there would be a long benefit from that time-limited course again. So that might be a patient where I put them on acalabrutinib on its own, for example, with the expectation that they'll stay on it as a continuous therapy rather than time-limited. So it's it's really going to be kind of individualized, and, and this is an area that we're actively studying to try to understand better. Great. Well, doctor, we have still so many questions, but it, it is that time. So uh, we, we hope you come back and join us again, but do you, do you have any closing thoughts for our audience before we wrap up today's session? Yeah, thank, thanks, Doreen. Great job asking the questions. Uh, I, I really just have a couple of things to, to leave you with. One is that it, it remains a very exciting time in CLL in terms of the new therapies that are coming along. We didn't even really talk much today about CAR T cell therapy or bispecific antibodies, which are some immune-based approaches to treat CLL that are on the horizon. Uh, and, uh, you know, even with the existing therapies we have, uh, patients are, are doing very well, certainly much better than when I started doing this. Uh, and so I'm very optimistic about the future for patients with CLL. Uh, but the way that all this progress has been made over the last decade and decade and a half or so is through clinical trials. So I do strongly encourage patients to consider clinical trials. It's not for everyone, uh, 
Uh, but this is a way to often get access to cutting edge treatment for yourself, but also to advance the field for other patients. And so it is something I strongly encourage patients to consider. Well, thank you so much for your time and expertise, Doctor. We're very grateful for your participation. And like I said, you, you move around really with much facility. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, we'd, like to, we'd like to thank everyone who joined us today. And we'd also like to thank our generous donors and grant support from AstraZeneca and Bygene for making this event possible. A few brief reminders. If you are a Facebook user, please remember to like and subscribe to the CLL Society Facebook page. Please complete the short event survey linked in the comments section on Facebook, and that link will be shared with everyone who registered. This is our fourth uh, Ask Me Anything event, a live event, and we really wanna hear your feedback. Please join us next on August 21st for CLL Society's next webinar, Beyond the Diagnosis, Surviving and Thriving with CLL SLL with Dr. Heather Wolf. If your question was not answered today and we had so many, uh, please send it to our Ask the Expert email service. The webpage for this free service will be provided in the comment section on the Facebook page and can be found on the website under programs and support. Please remember CLL Society is invested in your long life and you can invest in the long life of CLL Society by supporting our work. Thank you, and we sure appreciate you uh, attending today and hope you got some good information and helps you along on your CLL journey. Thank you so much.